If you're a fan of authors like Jane Austen and Charles Dickens, you'll often find that they mention foods that were very popular in their day, but have all but been forgotten. Like route cakes, a little snack meant to be served at the wildest of 19th century house parties. So thank you to Trade for sponsoring this video as we party like it's 1806. This time on Tasting History. Mentions of these little route cakes are found in all sorts of writings from the 19th century, from the works of Charles Dickens, to William Makepeace Thackeray, to one of my favorites, Jane Austen. For Austen, it's in her 1815 novel, Emma, on which Clueless, one of the touchstone films of my generation, is based. They're mentioned in regards to Mrs. Elton, one of Jane Austen's most dislikable characters, and in Clueless, she's at least somewhat the counterpart of the just as dislikable character, Amber. Whatever! In Emma, Mrs. Elton is gossipy, judgmental, and a real snob and a half, but she is rich. And the main character, Emma, who is also somewhat dislikable, she judges Mrs. Elton for being rich, but not having any familial connections. She brought no name, no blood, no alliance. Other than an elder sister who was very well married to a gentleman in a great way near Bristol who kept two carriages. And just as Emma judges Mrs. Elton, Mrs. Elton judges pretty much everyone else. She, having money, had become accustomed to attending the finest parties and dinners in Bath and Maple Grove. So when she arrives in the village of Highbury, where most of the novel takes place, she was a little shocked at the want of two drawing rooms, at the poor attempt at route cakes, and there being no ice in the Highbury card parties. No ice I can forgive, only having one drawing room, well, if you must, but a poor attempt at route cakes, there is no excuse, because they are just so easy to make. At least if we follow this recipe from 1806, from a new system of domestic cookery by a lady. That lady being a woman named Maria Rundle. Route drop cakes. Mix two pounds of flour, one ditto butter, one ditto sugar, one ditto currants, clean and dry. Then wet into a stiff paste with two eggs, a large spoon of orange flower water, ditto rose water, ditto sweet wine, ditto brandy, drop on a tin plate floured, a very short time bakes them. Now other recipes from the period, most of which are actually based on Maria Rundle's recipe, uh, sometimes lean more heavily on the alcohol or sometimes more on the florals, uh, or add different ingredients like candied peel to sweeten them, but one thing they all have in common is they are rather dry. They're more like a dry cookie or even a biscuit than what we would think of as a cake. And because they are so dry, you're gonna wanna have something to drink with them, either a cup of tea or perhaps a cup of coffee from today's sponsor, Trade. As America's number one specialty coffee marketplace, they aren't the ones making the coffee, but rather they work with over 50 independent roasters from across the country. And once those beans are roasted, they are set to ship within 48 hours. So they are always fresh when they arrive on your doorstep, just as if you'd visited the roaster yourself. I love the variety that Trade offers because it allows me to try new roasts that I wouldn't try if I was just getting coffee at the store. Yes, they do send me coffees that they know that I'm going to like, and I always do, but once in a while they'll throw me a curveball, something that I wouldn't think that I would like, and yet, always, it is spot on. Like this Flores Bellis from Huckleberry Roasters in Denver, Colorado. It has the sweetness that I enjoy, but also a little orange acidity, which took me by surprise, but it turns out I loved it. So visit drinktrade.com slash maxmiller, and when you subscribe, you will get your first bag of coffee for free. And Trade guarantees that you're gonna love that first bag, or else they will replace it for free. So visit drinktrade.com slash maxmiller and get your first bag of coffee for free when you subscribe. And now with your coffee in hand, we can go ahead and make these route cakes. Now you'll note that this recipe actually makes like 80 route cakes because they are meant to be served at a large party. I'm not going to make 80 route cakes, so I'm going to cut the recipe into a quarter. Uh, but if you need 80, just times it all by four. You'll need two cups or 240 grams of flour, a half cup or 115 grams of salted butter, a half cup plus one tablespoon or 115 grams of sugar, three quarters cup or 115 grams of currants, one egg, two teaspoons of orange blossom water, two teaspoons of rose water, one tablespoon sweet sherry or other sweet wine like Malmsey, and one tablespoon of brandy. In a large bowl, work the butter into the flour with your fingers until you have a crumbly mixture. And then add the sugar and the currants and mix until everything is well combined. And then add the egg in. This is also a good time to move from using your hands to using a spatula. Once the egg is incorporated, then add in the orange blossom water, the rose water, the sweet wine, and the brandy and stir everything together until you have a stiff dough. 
And this should be a stiff dough. You really just want it to kind of come together. But if you need to add any more liquid, I would lean more heavily on the brandy and the sweet wine rather than the florals because it can quickly taste like soap. Um, so lean on the alcohol. Once the ingredients come together to make a dough, scoop heaping tablespoons of it out onto a lined baking sheet. And these are route drop cakes, meaning that the dough should just be dropped on the tray rather than rolled into any particular shape. Also, because they are rather dry, they don't spread really at all, so you can probably put them closer than I did. Then set them on the middle rack of the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 175 Celsius, and bake for 15 to 17 minutes or until the edges have started to brown. Then remove them from the oven, let them cool for about five minutes, and then set each cake onto a wire rack to cool completely. Then repeat all of this until you have baked all of your cakes, which, again, are really more like a biscuit in the modern British sense of the word. And if you are a fan of British biscuits, might I suggest this book by Lizzie Collingham. It is called Biscuit. It is just a wonderful book all about British biscuits, and it goes through so, so many of them that I didn't even know existed, and gives a little history about how they were developed and everything. Wonderful book. It even does mention route cakes. So I'll put a link to where you can get that book uh, in, the, in the description. So while you finish baking your route cakes, make sure you are subscribed to Tasting History as I tell you a bit about the origin of this wonderful 19th century baked good. So as I mentioned, these cakes got their name because they were meant to be served at a route. But what is a route? Because today, we would usually think of a route as a devastating military defeat of some sort. And that definition does appear in the 1773 edition of Samuel Johnson's dictionary, where he says route means to dissipate and put into confusion by defeat. But in addition to that, there is an even older definition that goes at least back to Shakespeare that says a rout is a clamorous multitude, a rabble, a tumultuous crowd. And that is the type of rout that gives this cake its name. Starting in London in the mid-18th century, there was a new type of party called a rout that became all the rage amongst the upper crust of society. A Lady Jane Coke wrote in a letter to her friend, Mrs. Eyre, that you should have been in the fashion and had a rout. There is no end of them here at this time of year, and I dislike them almost as much as Mr. Eyre does. However, I think whilst one lives in the world, its customs must be complied with or else retire. But what exactly is a rout? How is it any different from any other party? Well, in 1792, an article from the Waterford Herald gave an excellent description. It's quite long, so I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I will read the highlights. But if you do want to read the entire article, I will include that in the next Tasting History newsletter, which you can sign up for at tastinghistory.com. But for the highlights, a rout is an assemblage of people of fashion at the private house of one of them. Lady A chooses a distant knight, and she issues cards, intimating that on the night specified, she sees company. These cards are sent to several hundred people, not because they are relations or friends or acquaintances, but because she has seen them, or because their presence will give an éclat to the thing. Before 11 o'clock at night, which is high tide, the house is crowded with a company of both sexes and all ranks. Card tables are placed in every room in the house, and as many in each room as barely leaves interstitches for the players to sit or move about. Coffee, tea, and lemonade are handed about. Confusion is the very essence of a rout. Many more persons are invited than the place can hold, and she enjoys the inconvenience, the fatigue, the heat, the blunders of the servants, the miffing of articles of dress, or the tearing of them, the repeated exclamations of, Good God, how hot it is! Bless me! Lady Betty, I am ready to faint! etc., etc. The lady of the house, whose happiness may be deemed perfect if she hear that some of the nobility's servants have been fighting, some of the carriages broke, or some of the company robbed by the pickpockets at the door. And now you can see why Lady Jane Coke disliked these types of parties. She was nearly 50 when she was talking about going to them, so doesn't seem like she would want to go to what sounds like an absolutely horrible frat house party. Uh, with, with pickpockets at the door. And if she's anything like me, and it sounds like she kind of is, she'd probably rather be in bed by the time the shindigs even got started. Because they begin about 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening, and those who arrive latest are esteemed the most fashionable. The number invited is generally three times more than the rooms will conveniently contain. Of course, the entertainment principally consists of pushing and crowding. 
Now, in that first article from 1792, it talks about how the ladies would endeavor to plan their routes for a night that nobody else is having one, so that everyone could come to theirs, and it would last two or three hours. But as time went on, by really the early 19th century, that was no longer the case. The Morning Post from London in April of 1801 includes a section called The Fashionable World, which would lay out a schedule of fashionable arrangements for the week. Along with balls, suppers, and dinners, each evening of the week would include several routes. Like one Friday evening had eight routes on the calendar, including those of the Duchess of Gordon, Lady Porchester, and Mrs. Benyon's route in Grosvenor Square. And the reason they had abandoned the idea of only having one of these parties was because instead of lasting two or three hours, you'd only be at them for like 15 minutes before you would move on to the next, kind of like a bar crawl, but for fancy houses. And so gone were the days of the cards and the dances and the entertainment, and it was just all about getting too many people into too few rooms. In 1810, Louis Simon, a Frenchman who moved to America, visited England and wrote about his experience in an American in Regency England. Through his words, we can see what these parties were like from an outsider's perspective, and they had really gotten out of hand. Instead of setting up card tables, the house in which this route takes place is frequently stripped from top to bottom. Beds, drawers, and all but ornamental furniture is carried out of sight to make room for a crowd of well-dressed people received at the door by the mistress of the house. Nobody sits. There is no conversation, cards, no music, only elbowing, turning, and winding from room to room. Then, at the end of a quarter of an hour escaping to the hall door to wait for the carriage. From this route, you drive to another. With these images in mind, it's easy to see why they weren't serving full meals at these parties, but if they were serving anything to eat at all, it was little finger foods like the route cakes that we're making today. And route cakes weren't just for the parties. They started out that way, supposedly, but eventually they were served at all sorts of gatherings, and they would be sold at all of the preeminent confectionaries and bakeries of England. An ad from 1787 in the Bath Journal says that Ford, from the late Mr. Gills, at his shop in the churchyard, Bath, supplies cut pastry, Perigord pies, route cakes, one shilling sixpence per pound. Perigord pies are a sort of pie that's usually made with truffles and the liver of partridges. So I'm glad that I'm making the route cakes today instead. Also, I love at the bottom of this ad that it says, A sober lad wanted as an apprentice. I just love reading old newspapers from this period. There's just always so much good stuff in them. And as I went through these newspapers of England in the early 19th century, route cakes began coming up more and more and more. So by the 18-teens and 1820s, they're being served at almost any dinner that is mentioned in these newspapers. And they would mention the full menu of many dinners going on in any place. Like at an 1827 dinner at the Guildhall in Bristol, dessert included 200 pounds of pineapple, apples, 100 dishes of hothouse grapes, 200 ice creams, 60 dishes of apples, 60 dishes pears, 50 Savoy cakes ornamented, 30 dishes walnuts, 75 ditto dried fruits and preserves, 55 dishes route cakes, 20 ditto filberts, 20 ditto preserved ginger, 4 ditto brandy cherries. 55 dishes of route cakes, and I don't know how many were on a dish, but I'm guessing it was a lot. So with so many of these little route cakes lying around, it's no wonder that Joseph Sedley could absolutely gorge on them in the novel Vanity Fair. He contented himself with a bottle of claret besides his Madeira at dinner, and he managed a couple of plates full of strawberries and cream and 24 little route cakes that were lying neglected in a plate near him. And I don't think I'm going to be able to eat 24 of these, but I will at least eat one or two of these route cakes, which should be ready. And here we are. Route cakes from Regency, England. So I do wish that they had kind of browned more on the top, but they were starting to brown too much on the sides, and I think it's just the way that the, the dough kind of sat. Um, but they still look lovely. They are heavy for like what, what they are. Kind of like rock cakes, if you've ever had those. Let's give it a try. Hmm. Hmm. That's actually wonderful. Is it dry? Yes, it is dry. I'm gonna want to have something uh, to drink alongside this, but it's not unpleasantly so. It's it's more that it's just dense, um, kind of like a a crumbly texture, you know. Um, but the flavor is wonderful. It's just sweet enough. You get a little bit of the brandy and, and whatnot, 
but those florals do shine through. I wouldn't add any more because this is perfect. You get the orange blossom, you get the rose, they they just kind of liven it up and and just it's a wonderful flavor without being overpowering. Even if you don't like floral flavors, I think that this is a good a good way to start. Then the texture of the of the currants really adds something because they are so dry. I think if there was no fruit in them, they would just be it, it would be too monotonous uh, of a texture. But with the fruit in there, it really just makes the texture a lot more pleasant. These are the sort of thing actually that you probably could just sit there and mindlessly eat 24 of them. I'm not going to do that. So make some route cakes, sign up for the Tasting History newsletter, and I will see you next time on Tasting History.